Hi, everybody. Welcome to our panel, Gender, Race, and Comic Book Coloring. Did you know that comic book colors used to be hand separated by an army of women in Connecticut and other places, or that Ben Day dots are named after a real person, or that there is a technical reason that brown skin tones look wrong in old comics? Today, we're going to geek out on the hidden corners of comics history from the golden age up to today's era of digital coloring and learn about the craft and history of coloring. I am very excited to introduce our panelists. If I can get the correct page going, there we go. Uh, we have today with us today, we have Marissa Louise, who is an Oregon based colorist who's worked with Marvel, DC, Image, Dark Horse, and many other publishers. After training in traditional media at the Pratt Institute in New York, Marissa transitioned to coloring in 2012. She has organized multiple communities of colorists, both national and international, and safe entry-level networking events for comics creators. You can find her articles on coloring at Women Write About Comics. Mildred Louis, Mildred Louis no relation, is a comic creator born and raised in Boston who now lives in Southern California. Since launching their first webcomic series, Agents of the Realm, a magical girl-inspired college-aged adventure in 2014, they've since launched two more, the sci-fi webcomic Catalyst Overdrive and an 18 and over high fantasy comic called Bound Blades. They have worked as a colorist on Invader Zim and Rick and Morty's Mr. Poopy Superstars, which has to be one of my favorite titles of all time. Uh, Mildred also founded Astria's Nexus Studio, a creative arts studio uh, designed to house their work and to provide a safe space and network for other creatives they admire. We also have Zoe D. Smith. Zoe is a PhD student at the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on comics, pop culture, and genre history, and the inter their intersecting ways of making meaning, deep stuff. Her essay for colorism on the historical treatment, treatment of brown skin and comic books can be read on women write about comics. And we will touch on some of that today as well. Todd Klein has been designing logos and lettering comics since 1977. He's won 18 Eisner Awards. I think I presented one of them to you in fact, nine Harvey Awards, two Eagle Awards and three Ringo Awards for best lettering, all well-deserved. He's perhaps best known for lettering Neil Gaiman's The Sandman, Bill Willingham's Fables, and America's The America's Best Comics line from Alan Moore. He lives in Southern New Jersey with his wife and a variety of cats. And I am your host, Anina Bennett. I'm a writer and a recovering comic book editor. I previously worked at First Comics, Dark Horse Comics, and other publishers. Uh, I've collaborated with my husband, Paul Guinan, on graphic novels and illustrated books uh, since the 1980s, including the science fiction series Heartbreakers and the historical fiction books Boilerplate and Frank Reed. I am super nerdy about comics, history, and science, among other things. And so without further ado, let us dig into this topic. So Marissa and Mildred is our resident uh, expert colorists. Um, can you explain a little bit about the differences between um, uh, RGB and CMYK coloring, which is uh, what we're looking at a representation of now? Mildred, you can go first. Uh, well, I guess like my history with it is pretty funny. Like I had to learn on the fly how to work with CMY colors because I came from an animation background. So that was like all RGB. Um, so CMYK is definitely a bit more restrictive than RGB coloring. Um, so it was a bit more of a process to like learn how to still get those same variety so that you can get an RGB that you can get in CMYK. But I'm sure Marissa can fill in like the more <laughs> detailed you know it. it's so funny that that you came from rgb because i came i have a background in painting and mm. printing and so i understood cmyk and it like <laughs> was totally breaking my brain to try and figure out rgb and how all that stuff works <laughs> really? so it's funny we're opposite on that but the reason it was so confusing for both of us even though it's still just color theory yeah. right is rgb is and i always get this backwards so i'm gonna double check RGB is uh, subtract uh, additive color mixing. RGB is additive color mixing and CMYK is subtractive. And I know that sounds backwards, <laughs> which is why I'm always confused, but that's what it is. So um, as you can see in this, 
uh, as you add all the colors together, they make white light. And that white light bounces directly into your eyes. It's like thinking of uh, gels when you're lighting uh, a play, which maybe nobody has done. <laughs> but, uh, and then- so uh, is what we would usually see on a computer screen or a TV, right? Yeah, it's your cell phone, it's a com computer screen, it's a projector, it's anything that projects light directly towards your eyes. And uh, CMYK or paints or watercolors are all uh, ways of getting light that it bounces off the surface and into your eye. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about CMYK color because, uh, as well as RGB later, because CMYK color is used for printing. And just for people who don't know, CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which are the four colors used in comic book four color printing. RGB stands for red, green, and blue, which are the colors you'd usually see on your computer screen. And if you've ever tried to switch modes in a program like Photoshop or any other program that has both RGB and CMYK, you can see it makes a really big difference when you change something that was colored in one system to the other, other system. The colors don't come out the same, right? Yeah, there's really fun stuff about gamuts and like light waves and stuff like that, but it's we can Very save that for the director's pet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a little bit, Marissa, of what you were talking about uh, as far as how the how the how light interacts with these colors and 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 comes to your eyes, right? Yeah. So on the CMYK, the light bounces into the color, and then the wavelengths that are um, not absorbed bounce back into your eye, and that is why it's subtractive. It's subtracting the extra wavelengths. The RGB is bouncing one wavelength directly into your eye, and that's why it's additive. And these are also sometimes called um, transmissive. RGB is transmissive color because it's transmitted directly from the screen to your eye, and CMYK is reflective color because it's bouncing off the page and then to your eye. So Mildred, having come from RGB color, um, we can talk about this a little bit more later when we look at your work too, but what kinds of, you said you had to kind of learn that on the fly, what kinds of adjustments did you have to make in, to learn how to work in CMYK? I definitely have like two versions now of my coloring work for like there's one version that's like ready to go to print and one that's strictly for the web just because like I have a really huge obsession with using like magentas and cyan in my work. <laughs> And oh, wow. I know. <laughs> uh, and those are like two colors that are not printer friendly. So it was, it took a lot of time to like just get into the habit of like having a CMYK version that is less heavy on those colors. Um, that is a lot more printer friendly. Whereas like there's the RGB version for the web that is just like the full blown, like all out color scheme that you can get from those colors that I use. It really makes a big difference, doesn't it? We're going to yeah. be uh, moving through some segments here where we look at the the huge difference that even the paper something's printed on can can make in, in how coloring reproduces. Um, so here, uh, um, this is to give an example of how uh, of how these colors are actually used in printing. Todd, can you tell us what we're uh, what we're looking at here on the top and bottom row? Yeah, this is a progressive proof of an Avengers cover. So there's four colors of ink, and we're seeing on the top row the four different plates with each having just one color. On the bottom, they're added. So the yellow and red are added for the second image, and the blue is added for the third image, and the black is put on top for the fourth image. And the black always goes on last because that is kind of what holds everything together, as you can see by comparing those last two. So the black, the black, there's nothing there. Right. So the black layer that we're seeing on the upper right um, is essentially that's what the more or less what the the artist or the art team drew, plus the logo and everything. Yes. And uh, and then on the bottom row, um, this one that's sort of second from the from the right um, is showing what all the other colors look like, and then you put the black over it. And at exactly. this time, they couldn't include black in those other three colors, which is different from how we handle it in di digital coloring now. And when I was an editor in the, a comic book editor in the 1990s, um, I saw a lot of these because we were still, they still do use them for, for printing proofs, um, but they were especially important because of the, the 
process involving a lot of different people at different stages. So we had to see how these were all going to come together. But I think this is a great uh, demonstration of how the colors add up with each other uh, to produce this, um, this, this richer, fuller range of colors. And you can see the yellow does not reproduce well, and that comes into play in coloring um, and in reproducing different, uh, uh, different skin tones early on in coloring. Um, Todd served as a production artist at DC and, um, and had to do at least some coloring uh, during that period, right? Tell us what we're looking at here with your set of color, color paints. Sure, so everybody who wanted to color had to have a color set. So this is a cigar box divided up with cardboard dividers and little bottles. And each bottle, there's one pulled out, had a color. And uh, on the chart above that are the colors that I use most often. And in the bottle area below, you can see those colors are tinted pink so that I could pull them out more easily. So for instance, the bottle that's pulled out is YR, which is 100% um, yellow, 100% red, magenta. And that would be what you would use for Flash's costume, for instance, the red, or the red in the Justice League logo. Uh, that's not my color guide, by the way, but you know, it's the same principle. So, uh, so let me let me explain briefly what the the color guide was used for, and then um, and then I'd love for you to tell us what you were doing with these these color sets um, in, the, in the production department at the time. So on the left is a color guide um, that does not have any color codes written on it. Those little numbers and letters that Paul, that uh, Todd is talking about are color codes with percentages of the different colors. Um, so this is a guide with no codes that would have then been. This was done by Anthony Tolan, who colored uh, comics for DC and worked in their production department for quite a while. And uh, this would then go to a separate place to have it separated into the four colors for printing. And there's a variety of different processes that were used for that. So were you painting color guides, Todd, or were you painting separations or both? No, I was uh, doing color guides. So at the company or you know, the freelancers, they were doing color guides. Guides were just that. They were a guide for the separator to show the separator what they want, what you wanted. But you weren't act, nothing you actually colored ended up in the printed product. It was just a guide for the separator. So the guides went to the separator after being marked up with the colors, numbers that you wanted, and they would interpret what you did in their, in their process, which was painting masks for each color and each value of the color. So for instance, for the blues, there would be 100% blue mask, 50% blue mask, and a 25% blue mask. And then those three would be combined photographically to make the blue plate. Uh, covers were more involved because there they had more options. They could use graduated color, like a, as is seen in this House of Mystery cover. Um, and these artists worked in gray. Go to the next slide, and we'll look at the gray version. The one on the right, that's what the artist saw for the blue plate on this cover. And then when it became a blue plate, that's what it looked like on the left. So in other words, instead of, uh, so what we're looking at here on the left is the line, black line art, the whole thing, the black line art whole with thing, right. separations. And, and then on the, the right, right is just the colors. Right. And this blows me away that they did not paint these in these different colors. The blue is just to show what it would have looked like after it was photographed and converted. Sure, so it's they had to do every color in gray. Yeah. yeah, all the colors had to be in gray. So they had to know in their head how things were going to look when they were printed in color. It's really uh, difficult to imagine how you can do that, but they did. And, and the, inter the interiors um, in particular, uh, none of the separations were done at the publishers, right? They were done in separation houses? Yeah, pretty much by the time I started in 77, pretty much everything was done at Chemical Color in Connecticut. And this is the, the army of uh, housewives you were talking about. So, but they were doing the interior colors, the flat colors. The covers were done by uh, more, more skilled workers and they were able to work with gray watercolors and other airbrushing and things like that to give you uh, more variety on the cover. But the interiors were all flat color. And I think we'll see that coming up. Yes, and if you've ever read uh, old comics and seen uh, that a lot of the 
colors are, uh, and wondered why all the colors are very bright and, and don't have a lot of blends in them, it's because they just didn't have the printing technology to, to do that. And the color palettes were very, very limited. And this right. is an so, example of one of your color guides with codes on it, Todd? Yes, yeah, so on the left is one of my color guides with codes. So you would fill in the color on your guide with the, with the dyes. And then later you had to mark up what each one was for the, for the separator just so they knew for sure. I mean, they should know, but everybody's color set was a little different. So you had to make sure they knew which color you were after. And the colors that I, the dyes that I used weren't necessarily accurate, but they had to be different enough so you could tell which areas were which. And the printed version on the left, which is printed on newsprint and which is very absorbent and not, uh, not good paper at all. You can see what happened to the colors. They got very muted and dull and anything that wasn't a primary pretty much blends together. And what, uh, how, what percentage increments of each of the four colors were you using uh, at, by this time? Yeah, so at this point it was just 100%, 50%, 25% and of red, yellow, and blue. So, no black tones. so uh, what was the total color palette? Here? How many colors were you working with? Uh, six, I think that's 64. 64. So most comics up to, uh, well, I'm excluding early things like Prince Valiant, um, really early comics, because they had a totally different coloring process. But once the mass market comics came along, most comic books were coloring, colored using this incredibly limited palette, and there just were no colors in between available, right? And if you go back to the color set for a minute, um, there. These are the only, these are the colors that I used regularly. That's only um, 16, about 20 colors. Because a lot of the others were so similar to each other, you couldn't tell what you were gonna get. Anytime you mixed all three colors, it was a crapshoot as to what would show up. When it was if you were mixing yellow, um, yellow Simon and magenta? Yeah. So any color that needed all three, you never knew what it, how it was gonna print. So that's why so many primary colors were used. And having that limited palette um, is very, very different. Um, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, I think from there it went to, uh, at the time I think you could do 25% increments, except either Marvel or DC didn't allow 25% yellow because it didn't print very well. So the skin tones were different at the two publishers, yeah. the Caucasian. Was, DC, yeah. DC did not use any yellow tones. They only used 100% yellow. So all of the skin talents, for instance, were only 25% magenta. Which tends to look a lot pinker, right? Yes. So all the skin. Uh, for Caucasian so it, skin tones. Yeah, exactly. It was very pale, pinkish looking. Um, and we, by the time I was a comic book editor, I had already moved to 10% increments, which massively increases the number of available colors. And now with digital coloring, it's essentially, you know, any, like any increment that you want, as long as you understand how it's going to reproduce. Yes. I think there's a minimum of maybe three that you can go down to, but it's pretty wide yeah. range. There's not a visible difference when you get too low. Right. Um, so talking about paper stock and printing techniques and coloring is a great segue into um, what I would love for Zoe to talk to us about, um, which is how this affected the, uh, or how this contributed to different depictions of brown skin tones in particular uh, in comic books. Um, Zoe, can you tell us what we're looking at here, especially on the left? What's up with the green people? Yeah, so um, this is a gold key comic from the early 70s called Brothers of the Spear. Um, it was a Christmas gift for me from my mom when I was in college because she knew I was getting into comics. And she was like at a used bookstore or something. And this was in the, you know, just at the top of a three for a dollar pile or something. And she went and opened it and said, this is so truly bizarre. <laughs> for a lot of reasons, um, because of its extremely weird, like 70s um, African story, but also a lot because every page you look at, um, all of the black people are extremely, extremely green. Um, like I have, I think two or three issues and you can't, you can't find a normally colored dark skinned person. It's all just green. Um, so that really got me wondering like how, how does that happen? Like, how can you get to that point? So um, I started like collecting older comics a bit more and seeing that there was always going to be some kind of issue um, using this printing process. 
and that's what got me really interested um, as a just sort of academically. Um, I'm not an artist. Uh, trying to figure out what happens there. And what I found was exactly what Todd was talking about, which was that um, brown requires you to mix all three colors together. And um, when you're working on extremely inexpensive and absorbent paper and um, working with, you know, changes in the densities of three different things where, you know, you might get too much ink in one place and not enough in another place. Um, and you have to do that three times to get brown skin, um, you're going to get something that's extremely inconsistent. Um, even when it goes well, as you can see um, the image of Misty Knight on the right, um, it looked really stripy because the, when you increase the density, the dots would just sort of turn into diagonal stripes and they would sort of just cross each other and you can really see it with your naked eye. Um, I think that, and I what I found see, that also okay. has something to do with the angle that the dot screens are are, are printed at. That different printing houses um, used uh, or separators use different angles, and if you put the dot screens at the same angle, they line up with each other and create those. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it probably would have looked better if they'd like tried to sort of cross them a little more, or use a different kind of dot. Um, but you find that it is all about trying to save money when you're mass producing comics, you know. Um, you can see in the Torchian Heartbeats at the bottom right, this is a comic um, by Jackie Orms, a black cartoonist from the 1950s. And you can see there's lots of shades of brown um, that are extremely consistent from panel to panel. So um, I unfortunately am not really familiar with the printing process of Torchian Heartbeats because I couldn't get my hands on it. And it was an indication, so who even knows what newspaper it was, you know. Um, but it shows that the technology to print brown on newsprint was available, but it was just that when your um, comics companies, I think just made the choice to say, we can only afford to do 64 colors on newsprint um, from, you know, through the um, mid 1980s, early to mid 1980s at DC, and I think a bit later in the 1980s for Marvel, um, which is when they started moving to um, better paper stock and a different printing process, which enables more clarity of color. So Marissa and Mildred, since you both have uh, a lot of technical knowledge and Mildred, I know you've, you've done, you have all that production, print production experience. What could, what could go wrong to, to wind up with this, this page of uh, green people who are supposed to be brown? What are, what are the different factors here? There's, uh, there's quite a few factors. Um, Especially, so with Heartbeat, uh, she was working, like you said, in syndication. So it is my guess that she was working like a little more directly with her pre-production uh, people. Whereas mm -hmm. um, probably Brothers of the, Brotherhood of the Spears? Brothers of the Spear. There's Brothers a white guy and a black guy and they're like <laughs> blood brothers. Yeah. Okay, so probably on Brothers of the Spear, either they had like a super inexperienced colorist who couldn't visualize how things would print. They could have had like, uh, they probably weren't talking to their separators at all, like uh, Todd had mentioned, uh, that things would go off to a separator. The separator uh, may not have known uh, the different color combinations. <laughs> That's all in that small section. Then you get over to the print house. Now at the print house, all kinds of crazy stuff can happen. Like plates can get switched. Uh, there can be, uh, I think a few slides back, there was that image of beast and you could see how the shadows and the blue were inversed. It's because mm. the, the, the separator got uh, maybe something a little confused in their head. And so instead of putting the red where there should be more density, they accidentally got it reversed. And they put the red where there should be less density. So mm -hmm. that's another thing that could have happened, uh, you could have had like um, the reds here are printing very, very transparently. I'm willing to guess that that red was supposed to be a super saturated red, but they cheaped out on the red dye. And mm -hmm. if you get a cheap red dye, it's incredibly transparent. Or if you mix your, uh, you can, you have to mix the ink transparencies when you're printing. And so the other thing that could have happened is they could have had a, a new tech on the printing press who was mixing the reds too transparent because red gets very uh, sticky. 
and uh, will strip the plates really badly if it if it's not thinned out appropriately. So, you know, there's a million things that can go wrong, yeah. and and it's a it's a mysterious process. I that doesn't yeah. mean you shouldn't put the effort in, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's just always sort of, um, it's sort of a shame. That's how I felt at the end. I was like, this is just really a bummer where the 1970s was this period where um, creators were introducing all of these new Black characters and really trying to capitalize on Black exploitation and um, relate to a new audience and do all this other stuff. Um, and it was just this, trip right out of the gate you know if you're um a young black person and you open up you open up a luke cage book and he has super powered invulnerable skin but his skin is you know brown in one panel and army green in the next one like that's kind of a different kind of extreme invulnerability right to have even the way that you to have so little control over the way that skin looks from one panel to the next um, because of technology and because of the, um, where comics, um, where the big houses wanted to invest their money, pretty much. And, uh, there's a, there's a triangle of, uh, of artists, artistic work, which is, do you want it quick? Do you want it good? Or do you want it fast? I mean, or do you want it cheap? Or do you want it good? Or do you want it fast? So they, they chose fast and cheap. Over, as, as there too. You can only choose two of those three things. Yes, that really was the dominant uh, uh, driving economic factor for behind a lot of this. And the only way that the audience could communicate with publishers was by writing into their letter columns, um, if they had letter columns, or potentially once comic book conventions started up, you might be able to talk to somebody at a convention, but there was no social media where you could tweet at them and say, and say, hey, why do all these, you know, people look weird? How come the colors look different from one issue to the next? Yeah. Um, uh, this this uh, this is showing. This is also from your essay, Zoe, and this is showing a little bit of what you were talking about with um, with Luke Cage, a character I've always loved. Um, and the bottom uh, panel, um, tell us why it looks so different from the 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 top one. Is Luke Cage as originally printed on um, a newsprint, right? Yes. Um, so the first one is um, a copy that I have, and part of this, my issues are very yellow. Um, because I can't afford mint condition stuff on eBay. Well, that affects things too, um, the quality of the paper uh, as it ages, um, mm -hmm. it's part of, the, part of the, the medium. Yeah, um, although I did ask around a little bit and they said, yeah, probably it won't really change the color values, although you will obviously have to keep track of like, you know, bit. stuff's gonna look more yellow, Yeah, obviously. Um, but yeah, the lower right is um, a screenshot of the same section from Marvel Unlimited. Um, so it's basically, it's just the digitized version of the same comic um, that appears to me to be um, a pretty close, you know, it doesn't look like any new color choices were made during like digitizing it, which sometimes happens. Um, it looks pretty close. So that's just showing how the brown, the color is likely intended. You know, I think that's um, actually the same color, but it's just on much better paper. Mm -hmm. I think they, uh, they reproduce the original color uh, negatives on the much better paper. Yeah. Yeah, something that I started, I have, I've been noticing between these older print versions is just like how yellow the paper is in all of them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's going to impact how brown skin is going to look because if that red isn't there to really balance it out and add the warmth, then it's just going to end up looking really sickly and green and yeah, yeah and kind of ashy. Um, as yeah, you know, yeah, good point. And uh, I encourage everyone to go read this um, essay. There's also a, a part about how um, because of the the quality of the paper and because the paper basically f there is no white ink, so the paper is the white. Um, Caucasian skin. Um, where there's when there's very little color in it, it just sort of acquires the color of the paper. Um, whereas the uh, when you've got all of, already these three layers of dot screen um, for brown skin, it adds like a whole nother kind of muddiness to it um, when the newsprint starts to age. Um, and there's yeah. that kind of scrapey effect we were talking about. 
Um, so we're going to move uh, soon into the, the era of digital coloring. Um, and this is another example of um, on the top, we have a panel, a blow up of a panel from the Fantastic Four, uh, where Reed Richards is really getting pummeled, um, as it would have been originally printed. And next to it is the color chart. This is a, a, a publisher created official color chart that eventually replaced the kind of handmade color charts that um, that Todd and his and his uh, colleagues were making in the 70s and 80s. Um, and as the increments of colors um, grew, these color charts became much larger. But what we're looking at on these two rows is the same color chart reproduced on different paper. So you can see how much difference that makes. And the bottom image from the Fantastic Four, I think was actually recolored. Um, I'm not 100% sure about that instead of being reproduced from the original negatives, but you can see the huge difference in, in the appearance of the colors and in, even in the color of the whites themselves. That's really uh, noticeable on different paper stock and with digital coloring. Yeah, um, got any color, comment on the color charts? Yeah, those color charts add the 75% tones. That's why they were done. So now you have 25, 50, and 75% as well as 100%. But wow. on newsprint, they still look pretty awful. In fact, the whole bottom section looks the same. Whereas on cover stock, which is what the bottom one is on, you can really see the differences. Um, still a very limited palette though, right? We haven't gotten yes. close to the 10% yes. increments yet. Um, so here we have, again, two color charts. Uh, these are Todd's actual color chart examples printed on different paper. Uh, the bottom one's on cover stock, as you were just talking about. And then on the left, um, Zoe, tell us real quick what we're looking at here. This actually coincides with my period as an editor in comics. And then I thought we could ask our colorist to, uh, to talk about what what went wrong here, because it's definitely got uh, brown skin tones, but the whole thing looks pretty muddy. Yeah, um, this is, uh, I believe, static number two um, from the early mid 90s. And um, I mean, it's so it's so interesting to see the difference. I wasn't even really thinking about artistic value by the time I got to this point. I was just like, there's like four shades of brown and they all look fine. I was so happy. Um, and you can see that whatever the coloring technique is, it's really different because you have sort of um, graduated colors. It's not just the flat anymore. Um, you do have so many more shades of brown that are really um, hanging in from panel to panel. You know, um, it almost seems like a, and um, I tweeted at Noel C. Giddings, um, who you said you'd worked with, Anina, and um, I wish I could have kept up with her a little more because you know, it feels like excitement that you have this option, you know, after that, um, the color chart that Todd's talking about where you have all of the places where brown would be are just sort of smooshed together. Um, and now you can have two different skin tones and a jacket and you can have light responsiveness and you can have brick look kind of brown. Um, so this seemed to me to indicate really a shift um, that in my head was sort of aligned with the shift to offset printing that happened throughout the 80s and definitely in the 90s um, and a shift in the kind of color separation technology that was available that I was never to really that I was never able to really nail down but sort of this um, slow transition into digital color separation um, which gives you just a lot more options. Yeah, so there was a, I happened to be working as a comic book editor during this period, this exact period. Um, and I should say the color guides on the left are a little misleading because this page was produced with a much bigger color palette than that. Um, and I will a little later hold up a, what a color palette, a color chart would have looked like from, from that per era. Um, but this was a transitional period. So we didn't, we hadn't yet moved into the era where people like uh, Marissa and Mildred were really doing all the coloring and the entire, essentially what amounts to the separation process um, until you get to the printing stage. There were still p people doing separately doing color guides and then digital separations at this point. And the digital technology was much clunkier than it is now. Photoshop was not as easy to use. Um, I won't go off into the weeds about that, but I had to do color. I had to proof the coloring that was done by in-house separators at Dark Horse who were not colorists okay. themselves. And, uh, and the results were wildly different depending on who did the separation. So I can't 
swear to the fact that Milestone and DC were using um, digital separation at this point, but I think they were. So Noel probably did a color guide with codes on it, written all over it um, in 10% increments. Um, so similar to what we saw from Todd, but more detailed. And then somebody else, a different person somewhere else, who she probably yeah. never talked to, um, did the digital separations. Eventually that got to the point where they had freelancers doing separations and then it became one more, one, one job as the software evolved and the industry evolved. Um, um, they may be doing digital separations, but this to me, this looks like it's still the grayscale painted because the, the technology in Photoshop was only about a big fat round brush that was either soft or hard. And you would be pretty hard pressed to get some of these tight angles and those like nice um, uh, brush strokes and those nice gradients, unless you were like the most refined, elegant, intuitive digital painter. Because like that's a good you know, observation. I saw really a lot of really bad blends in the '90s. I think DC <laughs> was really late to move to digital uh, separations. Yeah, I think Mildred can talk about this. Like. It's, it's a challenge to make a digital not look digital, like that stuff that we really recognize in the 90s, because especially in the 90s, the, the, that the computer capacity was so limited, it couldn't recreate a brush stroke at all. Yeah, I've, I've found like over the years, especially just seeing how coloring techniques have changed and shifted digitally. Like so much of it is also using like filters to like get that more airbrushed effect and make things look a lot softer because I feel like brushes have changed so much, but there's still that like, you can still tell that it's digital. Um, so yeah, it, there's a lot that's changed over the, over the years. Yeah, and especially in this era, uh, the digital colors that were working, uh, they didn't have layers. They yeah. only worked in channels. So you probably had an alpha channel, which is a channel that doesn't print. And then you had your CMYK channels. And you were doing just like those plates that we showed earlier, um, but with literally just a hard round brush because the, the computer couldn't calculate anything more complex. There wasn't pressure sensitivity none of that stuff existed. So it was, it was basically like working on grayscale, imagining the color and drawing with a, a stick. If that we were lucky. Exactly yeah. right. Layers did not exist yet in Photoshop and people were using channels and it was not easy and there wasn't a lot of memory in the, in the computers. Mm -hmm. um, and at Dark Horse, the separations were being done on a uh, proprietary in-house system that they had bought. And so they didn't even, they weren't even using Photoshop. Um, That's it, cool. Really interesting working with Steve Rude on Nexus and trying to get um, the coloring that he wanted out of them. Um, and then we did have one issue that got printed with the with the plates switched, like uh, like you were talking about earlier. There was one, not the whole issue, but one page was like really psychedelic because they swapped, I think the magenta and the yellow or the magenta and the blue plates got swapped. Um, so the other thing that, that was happening during digital coloring at this time, which I don't know if it's uh, still, I don't think you have to do this anymore, but um, although this page was not colored, uh, separated digitally, uh, for things during this period that were separated digitally, they, the, all the blacks were supposed to be backed with a solid, consistent color to give them consistent density. Um, they called it backing the blacks. And at Dark Horse, at least, I know that um, they were supposed to put 100% cyan, so like pure cyan blue behind all the blacks. Um, because otherwise the blacks could have really varying density if you left chunks of other color behind them, basically. Um, and you can see it in some comics where they forgot to do that or they forgot to do it on part of the page. The black just turns gray all of a sudden. All right, so we're uh, moving from talking about the era where digital coloring was just getting started, digital separations were just getting started, and then we kind of went through a transition period where the roles you know, fairly quickly uh, came together and were unified in the color, the type of digital color artists that we see today. Um, so Marissa and Mildred, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, what you know about that stage of the evolution of the role, um, what role color artists play today and a little bit about the, the digital coloring process? Yeah, sure. This is um, some rainbow flats I did for Nolan Woodard um, on one of his uh, Marvel books. 
And even though those colors all look very close, they're separated by 10%. And this is not representative of anything in the comic except for the, the selection of the area under the line art. And that's all flats are. And they need to be very crisp, very ali aliased. Um, yeah, and Mildred, why don't you talk about your process a little bit? Yeah, mine's pretty similar, though I've started getting more into the habit of like using colors that are a bit closer to what I want the final product to be, just because during the flat process is usually when I start figuring out, like, figuring out like what the actual color mood is going to be for that entire page um, and whether I need to like adjust things. But yeah, I really try hard to make sure that everything is completely backed just because I also tend to use brushes that have a bit of a texture to them. So if they aren't completely solid, you'll have that effect where it's like randomly gray or blue or something in the line art. And what is that for people who don't know the technical um, terms, what, what is the purpose of flatting the colors before you go on to do the next stage? This is just to create the ability to make selections that you can color or that you can refine. Because like, uh, like I mentioned before, now we have a lot of uh, capabilities in how we color these things. And like Mildred mentioned, we can use a lot more layers, like your screen layers, your multiply, things like that. And if, if you think of it like um, transparencies stacked on top of each other, if they start to wiggle around, you get colors you didn't intend in places you didn't intend, or it slips out under the uh, black where you don't want it. It's, it's just to keep things organized and controlled. And it's basically, if I understand it correctly, um, blocking out the shapes that you're going to want to put different colors into so that you don't have to make those drawing decisions while you're doing the, the actual coloring, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no rendering. There's no color. I mean, there can, if you're flatting for yourself, there can be color decisions. Um, personally, I don't like it when my flatters try to make those color decisions because it throws things off. Um, so I prefer this this kind of flatting and Nolan did tur too. Um, and it, it's just creating the shapes. But if you're doing flats for yourself, you can start to make color decisions. One thing that's uh, that I forgot to mention during the last, the last bit was, um, uh, people are always surprised to find this out. Right now, today with digital coloring, it's very, very easy to turn line art into a different color, right? So if you want that guy's beard to be a different color, it doesn't have to be black. Um, but bef but in the before times, um, that was a fairly expensive process and it was done by hand until we got to a certain stage in digital coloring. They had to do it um, on the film, I believe. So. To, to change part of the line art into a different color was called a color hold. And you were limited to only a very uh, small number of them in any given book. And some books, some titles wouldn't allow them at all, depending on their budget. With these flats, you do like everything you want to be one color eventually. You make it in one color during the flatting stage and then yeah. you can change that one color all at once whenever you want. Yeah, so you can see on this one, um, the kid's face is all the same color. I know it looks really, really close with the 10%. It's, it's a little hard unless you have a real experienced eye to see the differences. But mm -hmm. yeah, on this one, it's panel to panel. It's all the same. Um, but none of those color selections repeat anywhere outside of that same object. Right. So you would essentially choose, you would select the face to work on. Yeah. By using the flat. Yeah. The flat color gives you a way to select just the face and then you would color the face. That's why exactly. the flats are there. Yeah. yeah and yeah. the select we're talking about is some specific tools in Photoshop or whatever program you're using, right? If you have that shape blocked out, it makes it much easier to um, to just go dink and it's it's all selected for you to work on, right? Yeah, exactly. And like some people like to do uh, an additional layer of just the panels separated so you can work at one panel at a time. There's all kinds of different and interesting workflows, but uh, you just gotta, gotta figure out what works for your brain. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I think it's probably carryover from studying animation. Is that like, I'll have a layer that's the background flats and then like a layer that's the flats for like any objects that people are interacting with and then like the skin and then the clothes and things like that. So it's probably unnecessarily neurotic. <laughs> But it also makes it a bit easier because then like for the background, it's easier for me to just like completely 
color behind the background character and make sure that everything's completely colored and there's nothing missing at all. Whatever works for your brain, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and here we have uh, some finished examples of uh, Mildred's artwork and coloring, um, which use really interesting color palettes that would have been, I'm going to say, impossible to achieve in the, the days of limited, very limited uh, color charts. Um, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here and your approach to uh, these color choices. Yeah, I have a really bad habit of like using magenta <laughs> in like all of my comic work, yeah, even though I can't, cool. I like know that it's not a good thing to do if it's going to print <laughs> because like yeah for this page this is I believe like this is the digital version so these are like the raw colors in RGB format and when I was doing like the CMYK version it took so much time <laughs> to work within that color restriction and trying to get the same level of like color variety and different differentiating between all the values too because that's the thing that I know that a lot of people who are used to working with RGB will do is they'll just switch it to CMYK format. I think that that's totally okay, but like you will lose so many. Sometimes it's really not okay. Yeah, like you will lose a lot of different colored values and your your piece will go from like super lush variety to just suddenly being like two, diff two or three different colors. So it takes a lot of time and patience to like learn how to work in both formats so that you can still get that same translation between both. That's amazing that you put that level of thought and effort into doing the um, different version for print because yeah. I'm pretty sure most comic book publishers don't do that. I mean, the, the larger ones. Yeah, I guess that's like the blessing of doing this all independently is that I can you can like, your it. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not working on anyone's budget. So I'm just like, I can just do whatever. <laughs> and were you happy with the print, the way this came out in print? Oh yeah, I was super happy. Like I learned a lot between, this is from the second volume of the, my Agents of the Realm webcomic series. And there was so much that I ended up learning between the first one and the second one, just in terms of like how to work better in CMYK um, and not make things look so muted and still capture that same level of vibrancy, even if it's not the exact same colors that are being used. Yeah, you know, one of the things that happened during the 90s with the advent of digital coloring is that colorists were, could suddenly use um, black tones or K-tones in their coloring, which you never could before. Um, so that, that is part of the reason that I think that, and there wasn't enough experience yet to gauge how that was going to reproduce in different combinations on different uh, paper. And I think that is, that contributed a lot to some of the muddy coloring, um, because when you reproduce anything that's got any black tones in it on absorbent paper, it just kind of gets gray and it gives it all this kind of monotone look. Um, so we're in a real different era now. Um, and then this one I love, this is also Mildred's, um, and I just love the characters, the, the expression, the body language, really different kind of scene um, than the action one that we just saw. Uh, who are these characters and where can we find them? So those are all the main characters from Agents of the Realm. Um, and yeah, like this comic definitely taught me a lot about coloring. A lot of it mostly was focused on like, how do you color so many different skin tones and still help them look like they're in the same exact environment, which is I feel like is just a liberty that's kind of offered now with this new digital age of coloring. Cause like before even looking at that, the page from like static issue two, I think it was. Um, and just seeing like the dark skin was just so muddled because there wasn't that variation, that gradation available to make lighter tones available on darker skin to give it the highlights that it needs so that it actually pops. Um, because that's also something I tend to notice with a lot of coloring of dark skin where it's like if there's a lot of focus on the shadows but in reality like our skin tone tends to bounce off a lot of life very easily and very like vibrantly um, and that gets lost in the shuffle so yeah that this comic definitely helped me learn a lot in terms of how to color different skin tones and still help them like help avoid keeping them from feeling like completely washed out in the background in the scene that's happening. Yeah, and here they're being lit by a TV, which I imagine has its own challenges in what yeah. we, uh, all these different skin tones. Um, yeah, if you saw this printed like that static page, like I would just cry if it was me. <laughs> um, okay, uh, well, that brings us to, um, we're just about the end of our panel. Uh, I, I did want to show this as an example of um, uh, just 
how much the coloring and the colorist choices and the coloring techniques um, contribute to the overall look of the of the artwork. Um, and that's color artists, I would say, occupy a more um, a, a more a better acknowledged position in the creative process um, now than than they did when I was editing comics and before that. Um, Marissa, tell us how you got all these different versions of of Robin. Yeah, so I'm not doing a great job <laughs> doing it this year, but uh, I try to pretty regularly run a colorist jam, which anyone is invited to. Um, and what happens is I tweet out uh, some flatted line art, and it's usually just a fairly simple pinup, so you can do it in your casual time. And then um, everybody colors it, and then we just compare um, how they look. So you can look on Twitter, you can look up the colorist jam tag and you'll see uh, uh, you'll see old ones and the, the line art and flats should still be available for most of them. Uh, and on this, the one that really I thought would be really interesting about this one is you have two interesting elements that you can see there's multiple solutions to. You have the, the composition square, you have that beautifully compa composed cape, right? And you can see how there's multiple different solutions of how do you address this like gorgeous but complex uh, composition when you're adding more value, which is what uh, which is what coloring does. You're increasing the range of value from two to however many you use. And you can see like some people chose to cast a little shadow. Uh, some people chose to do it very graphically. Some people chose to fade, some people chose to build it out, and, and it all has different results. Really, uh, really cool uh, thing to do, and also just very illustrative of the, of the, how the different choices affect the final piece. Um, and I didn't, I said I was going to hold this up, and I didn't. Um, I'm probably small on some people's screens, but this is a color chart from 1990 with 10% increments. And this is what they would give to um, colorists who were doing color guides and um, also to separators. I think this one's actually from a separation house. Uh, and you, I mean, like you can see, it's printed on one kind of paper. So it doesn't tell you anything about what those colors are going to look like on different kinds of paper. It was, it was like the Wild West back then. Um, okay, and we're just about out of time. So I'm going to just say real quick, uh, I did want to touch on the fact that since we talked about it in our panel description, um, Benjamin Day, who Ben Day dots uh, are, are more or less named after, was a real person. And um, this is just a quick slide showing uh, the Benjamin Day engraving studio, what some of the screens looked like, and a detail from a Tarzan, uh, an early Tarzan comic strip um, that used this coloring and printing process. Very, very different from the way that uh, mass market comic books are colored. We could do a whole treatise and a whole uh, conference just on that probably, but you can follow us on social media to find out more about that and other related topics. So I wanna say thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. Uh, it was really great talking to you about this and getting out into the, into the weeds about uh, comic book coloring. And thank you everybody. Thanks for coming to Comic-Con at home. Hope to see you in person next time. Bye. 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 Yeah.